this congregation officially became a welcoming congregation. Resolutions overwhelmingly passed at our national meeting have called for marriage equality, for anti-discrimination laws, for activism, and boycotts against cities, states, and companies that further discrimination. While the United Methodist Church, to name just one denomination, continues to fight over sexual orientation and gender identity, we, here, in this church, can look at our present and our past with pride. For much more than a decade, we've given our children and youth an anti-oppressive education. We've given our children and youth the intellectual and emotional and social and spiritual tools to fully value themselves as they are. We've been a safe and supportive community for our children and youth and families. We've saved lives. We really have come in this safe and supportive community, in this beloved and holy place. Let us worship together. And I'd like to especially welcome any guests or visitors who are with us today. Good morning. My name is Jenny Warnash, and I am the OWL team lead here at church. Tom asked me to share with you what we teach our youth and children in the OWL program here about gender identity. For those of you who don't know what the OWL program is, it stands for Our Whole Lives. It is a lifespan, comprehensive sexuality education program. It was developed jointly by the UUA and the United Church of Christ. There are six modules that present accurate information in developmentally appropriate ways, and those modules are kindergarten to first grade, fourth to sixth grade, seventh to ninth grade, tenth to twelfth grade, and then a young adult and adult. And we teach all of those children and youth modules here regularly. Three of them are every year, one of them is every other year, and the adult and young adult we have done occasionally and are hoping to do the adult again next year. Um, so in the kindergarten to first grade curriculum, uh, they don't explicitly talk about gender identity uh, as a part of the curriculum, but the teachers are always sure to say something like, um, sometimes what you feel inside about your gender is different than the parts we usually go by. So they're introduced to it early. Um, after that, the rest of the modules all do explicitly address gender identity, and it's generally uh, with gender identity, gender roles, gender stereotypes, and sexual orientation. And I'd like to show you what we do for the eighth grade. The eighth grade uh, curriculum was just updated, and um, there's a great visual to help, help everybody understand. This is my daughter, Olivia. Um, okay, so this is the SIEO model. So everybody has a label, basically, in each one of these four categories. I know we love labels. Um, so biological sex, a person's physical body including genitals, reproductive organs, chromosomes, and hormones. People are born biologically male, female, or intersex. So only three labels from there. That's the simplest one. It gets a lot more complicated <laughs> after that. So gender identity, a person's internal sense of their own gender. People may identify as a girl woman, a boy man, some of each, transgender, or something else entirely. People may or may not see themselves as or feel like the biological sex they were assigned at birth. And that's where the term transgender comes from. You might have heard the term cisgender. That means that the biological sex, such as female, matches the gender identity of woman. And if that biological sex that you were assigned at birth does not match the gender that you feel inside, or doesn't, uh, maybe it feels a little bit right, but not completely right, maybe it doesn't, it feels completely wrong, those, that's where the term transgender comes in. Not everybody uses that term, but that's the understanding of the, that's the definition of the term. Gender expression. The way a person chooses to express their gender identity through clothing, voice, mannerisms, behaviors, likes and dislikes, etc. Gender expression may be perceived as masculine, feminine, neither, or a mix of the two. Clearly a lot of um, cultural things come in here in gender expression. 
And finally, sexual orientation, a person's feelings of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attraction toward other people. A person's sexual orientation may be heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, asexual, pansexual, or something else. When I grew up, there were three choices here. You could be straight, you could be gay, or you could be bi. That was it. Now there are like 10 choices under asexuality alone. So this is changing. These, the, the language here is changing a lot. And the one, if you haven't heard it before, I just want to draw attention to pansexual because it's my favorite identity. It's, um, so pansexual means you, are, you can be attracted to a person regardless of their gender identity, regardless of their biological sex. So this is a, it's, it's not really a new term, but um, it's becoming more popular. So if you haven't heard it, you probably will hear it soon. And the, um, the other, uh, in, the, in the 10th grade curriculum, there is a great story called uh, Baby X. And um, it's actually just called X. So X is a child who is uh, so named so that no one can tell X's gender. The parents of Baby X are carefully chosen since most parents want either a boy or a girl and not an X. The parents have a very important job since they have to raise X with no expectations of what clothes to wear, what toys to play with, what activities to participate in, what colors to paint the walls, what friends to have, etc., based on gender expectations. X's life really gets complicated when X goes to school. Boys in this line and girls in that line, hmm, where does X go? The other kids don't like it when X is happy doing both boy and girl activities. And the parents of the other kids especially don't like it. They demand that X has to choose because X's ambiguity makes them uncomfortable. The story of X shows students how deeply gender identity and traditional gender roles are woven into our culture. And I just want to leave you with two final thoughts. One is that our kids totally get this. Um, they are so far ahead of us in terms of accepting and understanding gender diversity. They are really, really far ahead of us. Um, the other thing I want to say is if you want to learn more, if you Google Transgender 101 UUA, you will get a web page produced by the UUA that um, goes through a whole list of terms, explains some of the ones that I talked about, and a whole lot more. And they also talk about ways that churches can become more uh, opening, open and welcoming to gender diversity, um, such as, oh, I don't know, gender neutral bathrooms. And you'll notice on our bathrooms today, there are signs up. Thank you. I'm Deborah Klinger. I'm one of the OWL teachers. I teach uh, middle school and high school OWL. And I can't describe the honor it is to give our kids good factual information about all things sexual as well as tools for navigating sex and relationships. And while I find it ironic that two cisgender straight women are talking about gender <laughs> identity today, I think some of our experience, some of the experiences that fuel my passion for helping our youth understand and figure out sex and relationships fuel my passion for increasing everyone's understanding of gender identity. Let me start with January of 2015 when the night before my child, Eden, who I then knew as my son, Lennon, was going to head back to college in New Orleans, he came out to me as agender. But wait, first, let me tell you about my friend, ex-roommate, and fellow improv geek, Mark. Mark was schlubby and balding and really funny. In the early 80s, when I was his roommate, I'd helped him do the costumes and makeup for a short film he'd made in which he played all the roles, including the dame. We'd gone shopping, and I'd helped him pick out a bra and girdle and hose and a dress and shoes. A couple years later, when I was no longer rooming with him, but we still were friends, he confided in me that he'd always liked to dress in women's clothing. I had no idea. He'd started seeing a therapist who worked with men like him, and he had a female alter ego. He was, ex he was exploring whether he was her or whether she was just a part of him. And he didn't have a term for what he experienced or a label for himself. He just told me what I'm telling you. A few months later, she stopped by as her so I could meet her on his way to a therapy group get-together. And I was glad that he had a place to figure this out and that he let me in. But wait, let me tell you about 
college at UCLA in the 1970s. I'd been told by the friend who introduced me to the guy who became my boyfriend when I was home in San Diego for the summer after freshman year that he was bi, which I thought sounded intriguing and exotic and something my mother would not like. (laughs) I learned that he was actually gay, but he loved me, and that is another story entirely. Back at school, my roommate and her boyfriend and his roommate, who was gay, would hang out in our room and talk about sexual orientation and loving a person versus attraction to a sex and messing with traditional ideas about gender expression. For that last one, we actually used a word that describes this more succinctly, but it's not appropriate for church. My experiences such as these and others, living and being involved in theater and dance in Los Angeles, gave me a view of life from a standpoint other than just heterosexual and cisgender, which is all I'd known growing up. Which brings me to some terms I'd like to define. First, as Jenny said, gender and sex are not synonymous. Sex has to do with the physical body, and most but not all people are biologically male or female. Gender, on the other hand, is something only that a person themselves can know. It falls on a spectrum. But gender is assigned to babies by parents and medical professionals. I've cringed when I've heard pregnant women excitedly discuss the gender reveal event that they're planning, including the pink or blue balloons that they'll use to announce to relatives what their child is. And I saw a billboard advertising a company that plans gender reveals. I really wish they would call it something else. I guess sex reveal sounds too prurient for something that has to do with babies. I recently read an article about HB2 by a politician who used the phrase birth gender. There is no such thing. The point is made beautifully in a video that I've shown an owl of an interview with a trans woman in which the reporter says to her, so you were born a boy. She replies, I was born a baby. I was never a boy. (laughs) For most people, gender and sex match. These are some people, there are some people whose sex isn't clear at birth. These folks are known as as intersex. Their struggles with gender identity can be monumental if the parents opt for medical intervention to assign the child one sex or the other. This is a complex issue, but the majority of babies are born with a clear biological sex, either male or female. People whose sex is clear and whose gender identity is the same as their sex, such as myself, are cisgender, from the Latin root C-I-S, for nearest to or on the near side of. Transgender is from the Latin root trans, across from or on the other side of. And a transsexual, which is an older term, is a person, a transgender person, who had surgical and medical treatment to match their gender to their biological sex, or change their physical form to match their gender identity, I should say, other way around. But gender is not binary. It's not either or. It is a continuum with male and female on each end, In between are things such as gender queer, gender non-conforming, gender fluid, non-binary, third gender, two-spirit, and I'm sure many other terms. As Jenny said, they are always changing. (laughs) When Eden came out to me as agender, I thought I was up on all the latest gender identity terminology, but that was a new one to me. And it means simply having no gender, being just a person. And gender identity is a different matter entirely from sexual orientation. I have gay and lesbian friends who are confused by non-cisgender identities. My dear friend Larry, the college roommate's boyfriend's roommate, and I had lost track of each other when I moved to North Carolina and we reconnected several years ago. We went to see him during a visit to LA when Lennon was 15. He and his partner Greg had been together since they met at UCLA in the men's glee club and survived the AIDS crisis of the 80s that took the lives of many of our friends, had gotten married in the window when it was legalized in California and before Prop 8 put the kibosh on further same-sex marriages before it got legalized again. Larry is black and a bit of a flamer, and Greg a much more subdued white banker. At their home, they introduced us to their boyfriend, Fidel, who is Mexican and bisexual. And so I got to explain polyamory to Lennon, as that is something (laughs) Owl doesn't cover. (laughs) And yet... Despite Larry's considerable non-heteronormativeness, during our most recent visit, he said to me, I don't get trans people. I've asked a couple of them lots of questions, but I still don't get it. And I shared my take on it with him. I've had several people comment to me on how open I am. 
I used to be surprised by this as I'd assume that others who share my values understand and are as comfortable with the ins and outs of gender identity as I am, but I've learned that this isn't so, so I've given some thought to why this is. Certainly, part of this is that the kinds of experiences that I've mentioned earlier contribute to my getting gender identity. Personal experience with anything makes it easier to understand. But also, I think my spiritual beliefs lend themselves to this. I think of my beliefs more as suspicions, as I can't begin to know what's actually true. I suspect that our souls live on beyond our bodies, and that we reincarnate, and that most of us have had previous lives, some male and some female. I used to think of transgender as a matter of some sort of cosmic wire crossing in which someone incarnating as male landed in a female body by mistake. But now I suspect it's far more nuanced and complex. But whatever is actually the case, I believe, not just suspect, that the soul has no gender. The essence of our being is not male or female or any variation. It is timeless and ageless and genderless. And understanding this allows compassion and empathy that surpass conventional constructs of sex and gender. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny and Deborah, for speaking your, your truth this morning. Of course, you know, the, the service this morning, Transgender 101, is, um, you know, inspired, inspired by that awful piece of legislation. And, and on one level, it's tempting. It's tempting to see that House Bill 2 as, as absurd. And when faced with absurdity, an appropriate response is mockery. And over the past few months, North Carolina has sure been mocked. It's become the butt of jokes on late night television. Facebook is crawling with memes zinging our legislature and governor. House Bill 2 has been satirized in song. And I've laughed. I've laughed at some of the creative spoofs and parodies. I've even retold a few of the best jokes. But on a deeper level, I don't feel like laughing. House Bill 2 is not just absurd, it's evil. It stigmatizes and marginalizes a vulnerable minority population. Trans men and trans women are frequently the victims of hate crimes. They're murdered, they're bashed, assaulted for being who they are. They face discrimination in housing and employment. And we know, we know that trans youth have it especially hard. We know that trans youth face bullying and are at a higher risk for suicide, for self-harm, addiction, and depression. We know that being a youth is hard enough. Imagine going back to your youth, to your teenage years. Now imagine going through it while questioning, fighting the gender identity that you know is true. It's hard stuff. And so besides all the other things that House Bill 2 does, besides all the other stuff, it creates a hostile and fearful environment for transgender, transgender individuals here in our state. It says, you're not welcome in public. It says, back in the closet. And that's so dangerous for adults and youth, and that's evil. This is life and death for people I love. And so I'm not laughing. And this makes me even more committed, even more committed to strengthening and protecting this faith community, our faith community, as a place that's safe and welcoming and embracing and loving for transgender adults and transgender youth. I asked Jenny and Deborah to speak today because they're two of the leaders of the Our Whole Lives Sexuality Education Program here in our church. And so they are at, really at the front lines of helping to create a community that is loving and welcoming. Our whole lives is one of the best things we do. It's one of the most important things we do. The young people who go through it are taught self-acceptance and they're empowered to be accepting allies. Lives are changed and lives are saved because of this program. <coughs> Hear these words from the child of one of our members now well into adulthood who grew up in our congregation 
talking about the difference that we made in his life. I didn't have to lie at church. I didn't worry about my clothes or gender expression at church. I just changed the name on my name tag without any fuss. I talked about being trans with anyone I wanted to at church. The community church is a welcoming congregation in practice and officially recognized with that label by the UUA. Those words make me so proud to be here, so proud of you. We make a difference in surrounding young people who come here, who grew up here with support, with supportive peers, supportive mentors, supportive staff, supportive youth advisors, supportive director of religious education, supportive minister, I hope to be, supportive community. The truth is, I wish that every child growing up in North Carolina had a community like ours. It would make such a difference. And so that's the first thing that I want to say this morning, the first and probably the most important thing that I want to say this morning, that the safe and welcoming community that we create here saves lives. But I also want to talk a little bit about gender identity and theology because it turns out that there is, in fact, an intense connection between body and spirit, between gender identity and religious experience. One of the things that I do every year is go to our youths, our ninth graders' coming-of-age class and lead a couple of sessions. One of the sessions that I taught last year and this year had to do with different ways of understanding and imagining God. And so to get the discussion going, I give the whole class a list, a list with a couple dozen attributes of God, adjectives that different people use to describe God. So on the list are words like omniscient and omnipotent, all-knowing and all-powerful. I also put on loving and merciful and jealous just to see how they'll respond. I give them words like king, lord, master, creator, weaver, sculptor, trickster. And then I give them gender words too, male, female, transgender. And then I ask the youth to break up into small groups and to discuss these kind of attributes, these adjectives with each other, and then to come back and to tell the group, to tell the group which words they're comfortable with and which words they're kind of less comfortable with, which word is, strikes them as really uncomfortable for a way to describe God. And what's interesting, what's interesting is that both years I've done this, the coming-of-age youth have all adamantly rejected the gender words. They say, Tom, we don't want to think of God as male or female or transgender, the youth say. They're like, we don't want to think of God in those terms. I find that really, I find that really interesting. And I would ask us all to sort, of, to sort of sit with that and just hold that and kind of wonder what that's about. There's a story. Uh, you might have heard it from a friend, or maybe it's one of those stories that gets passed around. And in the story, there is a very vocal, outspoken, transgender activist decides to print up a shirt with big block capital letters that proclaim, spells out, God is trans. Where's, where's that t-shirt out in public? So the activist is wearing the shirt out in public and runs into an extremely orthodox religious person we're talking robes, we're talking beard, we're talking religious garb. And the religious person stops the trans activist and says, kind of whispers in that person's ear, just wanted to tell you, there's nothing even remotely controversial about that shirt you're wearing. It's true, in fact, in, in the Hebrew Bible, God is imagined as both masculine and feminine, as well as transcending gender. In Christianity, the Holy Spirit is often depicted as female. And so the Holy Spirit, which is not three but one, 
is non-gender conforming. The Trinity is both male and female and switching between and beyond. Among the pantheon of gods in Hinduism are many gods and goddesses who switch or even combine genders. Hinduism also includes the god Aravan, who is considered the god of transgender. Each year in April in India, transgender people come together for a celebration that includes, I'm told, 16 days of songs, dance, and events, such as beauty contests, street plays, and awareness programs. On the 17th day, the religious ceremony of wedding is held, where the priests perform rituals to solemnize the marriage of transgender people with the god Aravan. And for one night, all of them become the brides of Aravan and celebrate. I want to find out where that festival is and go. That sounds cool. We, um, the word hermaphrodite is a word that's not really used, not really kind of appropriate to use any longer. But in Greek mythology, hermaphroditus is the androgynous child of two gods, of Hermes and Aphrodite, Mars and Venus. And in indigenous religious traditions, transgender people often play special roles in the spiritual community. They're often chosen to serve in the role of shaman, as someone with special connection with the realm of the spirit and special spiritual powers. In some Native American traditions, people who are to spirit play a similar role in the community. So that religiously orthodox person when he stopped the activist and said, God is trans, when said that God is trans t-shirt, isn't it all controversial, was naming something, was naming something that is documented fact. That mystical experience in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam, in Hinduism, and in Greek mythology, in folk, and indigenous traditions the world around, that mystical experience tends to involve the subversion of the gender binary that mysticism is often experienced, religious experience is often experienced as transgressing, transgressing gender, as transgender, as gender fluid. So why then? Why then do we often seem, see forms of religion as being restrictive forces, as forces that try to deny people their humanity, force us into boxes, shame us, tell us that we are wrong, limit the human potential and the human experience. I would say that those religions that do that are at war with themselves and are divorced divorced from the experience of the sacred, the experience of the transcendent, which eliminates boxes. I think of Jesus and the community that Jesus kept. Wasn't a buttoned-up crowd. Wasn't a gender-conforming crowd. The New Testament is full of stories of Jesus hanging out with eunuchs with people in his day and age who don't fit easily within the gender boxes and the gender binaries. And so it is. And so it is that religious experience, mystical experience, tears down those walls, bursts open those boxes. And we do well as a community We do our holy work as a community when we come together not to create boxes, but to be a community and to engender, pun intended, engender, pun intended, such a world. Amen? I'm proud of us. We do good work. We do good work. We change lives. We save lives. We bless the world. We create groups of youth 
who are able to not only be community here, but are often the people in their schools, at their college campuses, in their peer groups, on their sports teams, in their drama classes, are the people who are bending the world towards justice. Amen.